So hello and welcome to the first instalment of the 2022 Southwest Marine Ecosystem webinar series. Uh, my name is Helen Chadwick. I'm one of the project coordinators for Exeter Marine Research Network based in uh, Penryn in Cornwall. Um, the University of Exeter will be hosting three of the sessions in this webinar series, and there'll be several more uh, hosted by our institutional partners at Plymouth uh, University, Marine Biological Association um, and Plymouth Marine Lab, and they'll be covering a broad range of marine topics. Uh, if you miss any of the sessions or any of today's session at all, um, then don't worry, they'll all be recorded and they'll be uploaded to the Southwest Marine Ecosystems YouTube channel. Um, and to kick off the series today, we have a fantastic selection of speakers who will be telling us um, about the state of cetaceans in our Southwest Seas and presenting some of their data from the last year. Uh, we have six short presentations, around 15 minutes each, uh, with a break in the middle, and there'll be two slots for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, unfortunately, a couple of our speakers are unable to make it today, but through the magic of technology, they've pre-recorded their lectures. Um, so fingers crossed, avoiding any technical hitches, we'll still be able to enjoy the content they've prepared. Um, so just some housekeeping, uh, do feel free to have your cameras on or off. Um, you shouldn't have been able to turn your microphones on, but <laughs> uh, that's not a problem. Um, so please post any questions that you have in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and as I say, we'll have a break about halfway through at about one o'clock. Um, so to start, we have Duncan Oliver, sorry, Duncan Jones, who is... No, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> co-owner and skipper at Marine Discovery um, Penzance, who run wildlife tours out of Penzance on their sailing catamaran. Um, being out at sea most days, um, they have spent many years collecting extensive photo ID and effort-based data sets. And Duncan will go through um, an overview of the Southwest Cetacean Records for 2021 for you now. So over to you, Duncan. Okay. To share my screen, do I click open share tray? Is that correct? Um, hang on, nope. The little arrow in the top right corner. Uh, I cannot see a little arrow in the top right corner. Hang on. Do you want me to share it for you? Yeah, um, yeah, hang on, hang on. Sorry. Um, no, maybe you might have to. Yeah, no worries. Um, I can't see an arrow in the top corner. So yeah, if you share it for me, um, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. So I'll just um, ask you to move on a slide. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, right. So yeah. So um, today I'm going to be talking um, about odontocetes, so toothed whale and dolphin sightings in the southwest in 2021, and then I think Dan's going to be doing the Mr. Cetes. On some of my maps, I have got some of the Mr. Cetes, the valley whales, um, shown. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about them because that's Dan, Dan's thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, if we can move on to the next slide. So in the on the maps that I'm showing you, I've got data uh, that includes data from the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. So they're very good at collecting um, data from across Cornwall. And um, that data set includes uh, sightings from uh, Atlantic Adventures. I haven't put them on my list here. AK Wildlife Cruises. Us at Marine Discovery, New Sea Spies and Fishing and Pasto Sea Life Spies, among many others, and also from watches around the, the coastline. Also, I've got some data from, from Orca, from Organisation Cetacea. So they have people on cruise ships and ferries, and they also have watches from the coast. 
And then from Dorset, I've got some from the Dalston Country Park, the Dorset Wildlife Trust, and South Devon, and uh, also from Dolphin Watch UK. Um, one thing that I need to say at this point is it's far from an extensive data set. Um, it's really hard uh, sometimes to get people to share data. Um, so there are lots of data sets out there that could be really useful to us um, in, this, in this exercise of trying to understand what's going on in the Southwest across a year. Um, but also, it's also very hard to contact lots and lots of different people. So um, to, to get all different little bits of data from everywhere. So, so this isn't a complete picture. And um, one of the things we need to consider when looking at this data, so if we take an analogy of rolling a dice, if you take a six-sided dice and you roll it enough times, Duncan, I don't know if it's your signal and you're muted. That's weird. Yeah. How long ago did I get muted? <laughs> um, did you, you were just saying now? it's a six. You were just saying it's a six. It's like rolling a six sided dice. Right. OK, so so if you have a six sided dice and you roll it, you, you can learn that each face of that dice will come up an equal number of times if you roll it enough times. If you take a weighted dice and you roll it, all you're learning is which side that dice is weighted on. And the same thing happens for bias data. So really this data set, all it's actually showing us is where people are recording data. It's not necessarily showing us where cetaceans are in the Southwest. Um, but all's not lost. There are still benefits to this data we're looking at at the moment, because we can see in these different areas where people are recording data, if there are upward or downward trends in sightings. But the problem is we don't know if those upward or downward trends would go across the whole region or if they're just um, so so like a downward trend, say, for example, an upward trend in common dolphin sightings, sightings across the whole region, or if it's just in that particular area or if they've moved from that area to somewhere where we're not looking. And the bottlenose dolphins are a really good example of this. So we've got the bottlenose dolphin project now looking at photo ID and we have a much better understanding of their range. But oh, not too long ago, it was thought really that they were a Cornish or, or Cornish and Devon pod of dolphins, and they didn't go much further. And when they disappeared out of the area, we wondered if that meant that they were disappearing forever. But now we know actually that they're ranging much further along the south coast from this project. And so effective, when they were disappearing from our area, they were going to another area. But through sharing of data and collaboration, we now better understand those animals. Anyway, can we go on to the next slide? Um, and then, so I've got a series of maps that I'm going to show you. They all look quite small, but that's because some of the orca data goes out almost to the continental shelf edge. And I wanted to keep the maps the same for each for, for each um, picture. So we've got bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins. This is, I'm looking at the key on the left, um, top left. Fin whale, that's for Dan to be talking about, humpback whale. Harbour porpoises, minke whale, Rizzo's dolphins, killer whales, and striped dolphins, and unidentified. And then the size of the circles relate to the group sizes, so between one and over 100. And so if we look in January, if you were looking at this map and you didn't have any other information, you would assume that, that dolphins and whales just occurred around Cornwall. But this is because Cornwall Wildlife Trust have got this long standing, very good, very inclusive data collection. Um, and so that's why we get, get good data from, from around the Cornish coast. And we can see that there's some um, good sightings of common dolphins in St. Ives Bay. So that's um, on the map just up here. And some harbour porpoises too. Good sightings in Falmouth Bay. And then uh, of common dolphins. We've got common dolphins and harbour porpoises off, up around Newquay and St. Agnes Head. And then up around Padstow as well. And then around Land's End, we had all the humpback sightings around January that Dan's going to tell you about. Big pot of bottlenose dolphins and common dolphins. And then up here, again, we've got commons, harbour porpoises, and, and, and bottlenoses. So we've got a, a good range of cetacean sightings. 
but we don't actually know if that extends beyond Cornwall or not because at the moment we don't have data. We didn't have or haven't got data for there. But it's an um, interesting start to the year. And, and one of the things that this these maps show us is that around the Cornish coast we have a year-round good presence of um, of cetaceans. Okay, can we go on to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so February again, it shows us something similar. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the Cornish data is in the winter months, we see more harbour porpoise sightings along the north coast. And then as we move round into later in the season, we get many more sightings around the south coast here and around Mounts Bay. And anecdotally, people have told me that along the north coast stretch here, they, they really only see or they see a lot more harbour porpoises in the winter months when they're out. We know that Annabelle and Chris do surveys for the uh, Cornwall Research, um, it's Cornwall Seal Group and Research Trust. And they record a lot more harbour porpoises in the in the winter and also on the watches in the winter up there. Um, OK, so we go on to the next slide. OK, so March again, similar similar pattern. We're also in lockdown at the moment. So actually, we're not running mo boat trips in Mounts Bay. Boat trips aren't running on the south coast um, at all. And so that's limiting our data set in 2021. So 2021 is an atypical year. And people's behaviour for watching from the coast might have changed as well because they might have had more time to be out or might have not felt like they could go out. And so the impact of, of being locked down on, on sightings are, are really difficult to actually quantify. Um, but again, we're getting a similar range of species, although the, the whales have disappeared, although there is a minke hiding in under there. But really, we're starting to get a few Rizzo's dolphins showing up as well here in St. Ives Bay and, and up on um, the, the east of Cornwall up around Lou as well, which is, is interesting, but mostly, yeah, harbour porpoises and common dolphins. And the other thing that's interesting in the winter months, now we talk, I talked about the bottlenose dolphins, we tend to see them, we think, more in winter months around the Cornish coast. And then as we come into the summer, they seem to head further to the east um, and spend their time along this stretch of coastline. So that at the moment there in 2021, in March and January and February, they were around the Cornish coast. OK, can we go on to the next slide? So then in April, the lockdown finished and boat trips started. And you can start to see a big batch of sightings uh, down in the West End of Mounts Bay. So we're running trips. We've got trips, AK cruises running out of Falmouth. We've got Padstow Sea Dice Safaris starting up. And we've got Newquay Sea Safaris running. And so we're starting to see a lot more sightings come in. Does that mean there are more animals around? Or is it just because we've got increased effort now? You know, we're seeing sightings further away from the coastline. We've also got sightings around Start Point and Berry Head um, because trips are going out of Dartmouth. And there's a good number of common dolphins up there. And um, got a Rizzo's dolphin sighting here. And some of these are further offshore. So Orca are starting to record sightings off cruise ships and ferry crossings. And so we're starting to get the idea that actually maybe what we were seeing off Cornwall could be extended across the whole region. Um, can we go to the next slide? And so then in May, this develops even more, and we're getting a lot of common dolphin sightings then up um, off, uh, off Berry Head and, and further offshore out here, so further to the east. And we're still getting good sightings around the Cornish coast. But one of the interesting things I wanted to talk about, can we have the next slide, is that there often seems to be a bit of a trend in um, sightings through May and June that relates to the thermocline. I did actually change this slide because um, and added uh, May and June. But so in yellow, you've got common dolphin sightings in March and April. And in red, you've got them in May and June. And then we've got the typical position of, of what we call the seasonal thermocline as it moves into the channel and up the North Coast. So a seasonal thermocline. So what happens is as we come through spring and summer, in spring, spring and early summer, the uh, sun starts to warm the upper part of the, of the sea of the ocean. And you get a fairly uh, an increase, but fairly uniform temperature down to about 50 meters in the northern hemisphere. The thermocline, seasonal thermocline, typically will sit between 50 and 200 meters. And what the thermocline is 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 the point at which you get maximum temperature change over minimum depth change. And um, so we get this what we call stratified warm water traveling in up the channel, and where that's meeting the cold mixed um, water that's been filled with nutrients from a, a winter's worth of rain and storms and mixing, along that front, it becomes very productive. So we get um, primary productivity, 
phytoplankton production, which leads to zooplankton production, and that then attracts fish species. And so along the uh, the boundary of the thermocline, as it might as it pushes up the channel, we get a really really productive area. And what we see certainly down in Mounts Bay is that we get when we first start our trips in March and April, we get good sightings of common dolphins and harbour porpoises. But as we go into May and June, we have a period where we have less sightings. So we're still seeing animals. You can still see the, the reds there, but we're seeing less than we would in other months. And it looks like we've got an increase in sightings, although again, the data is difficult because it's biased um, in May. And also if you add June in, it looks even stronger. And so we can see that maybe the animals are following the front of the seasonal thermocline as it pushes up the channel, or as it pushes north. And um, we see the same with harbour porpoises. So it's interesting things like this that we could track if we had more detailed data and we could then better understand how the animals are using our coastline. Um, OK, can we go on to the next slide? I need to speed up a little bit, I think. Um, so then uh, this is for June uh, in Mounts Bay. We've got a lot of harbour porpoises. They are overlaid on top of the common dolphins. And we're starting to get a lot of Rissos dolphin sightings as well. So the Rissos dolphins, typically we see them when the cuttlefish are coming into spawn. And, and we've seen evidence of cuttlefish at the surface when they're foraging. And, um, and so that tends to be in May and June. So that's a bit of a saving grace for us in Mounts Bay that when we have a lower sightings of, of harbour porpoises and common dolphins, we, we, the gap tends to be filled a bit by Rissos dolphins. We can still see that there are bottlenose dolphin sightings around the Cornish coast, so they're still hanging around. Um, but we've still, and we've still got this really good number of common dolphin sightings up around where the thermocline has moved to. There's actually an interesting study that tracks how um, bluefin tuna off um, Massachusetts follow the, the thermocline until that resource is exhausted, and then they move back onto other, other fronts. And so in June, the thermocline only really extends about this far up, and, and that resource gets depleted and then the common dolphins and harbour porpoises redistribute again. Um, okay, if we, oh, we've also got, um, sorry, on that map, a striped dolphin out here that was seen with common dolphins on one of the Yorker records. Okay, if we yeah, go on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so as we can see in July, once that thermocline resource is, is, is exhausted, the common dolphins start to spread back towards the west and we st we've got this really strong set of common dolphin sightings. The bottlenose dolphin sightings are all starting to move uh, east up the channel, and we're getting these really strong harbour porpoise sightings, although much less despite increased effort along the north coast. So we've maybe seen a shift in our harbour porpoises round to the south coast. Um, okay, so we go on to the next slide. Yeah, and then August tends to show a similar pattern, and the harbour porpoise sightings are, are really peaking into August, but we've got this. Uh, complete um, white out of common or common dolphin out of common dolphins, if you like. And it's been like that for the last few years. And 2022 is even stronger, where we're getting really high numbers of common dolphins off the southwest. And we're starting to wonder, maybe that's because, so typically, if you read a book from 20 years ago, it will tell you that the northern range of the common dolphins is about 50 degrees north. And if you look here, we're at 50 degrees north. So we were possibly used to be at the northern extent of their range. But typically now they're being recorded much, much further north up off the Scottish coast and so on. So it might be that we've moved into the centre of their range, possibly due to warming oceans, possibly due to change in plankton distributions. Don't really know. But what we do know is that um, we're getting consistent sightings of common dolphins throughout the year. And as and in Ju from July to certainly November, the, the ocean's thick with them off the, off the southwest. OK, if we move to the next slide. Um, this is, uh, this again, it is taking something to do with um, the oceanography of the area. So what we've got here, the blue lines show the bottom water temperature and the red lines show the surface water temperature. And you can see that here, uh, the bottom water is 12 and the surface is 16. And where you've got maximum difference between bottom and surface temperature, um, we seem to be getting more common dolphin sightings. And then where you've got a more similar surface and bottom temperature, um, we get less sightings. And so this works in the same way that, so where the boundary, the northern boundary of the thermocline kind of reached up to about here, where, where this temperature difference changes, there's still this bottom and surface water difference um, uh, uh, in the southwest. And so what we think is that 
that actually helps to where we've got cold and mixed water that might be more nutrient rich lower down in the water column with tidal mixing that could be brought up and and so the nutrients and the productivity from that held close to the surface and that can create potentially again more productivity and good feeding conditions um i explained that in rather a hurry so if anyone wants to ask a question about that please do um but yeah so where we've got this this temperature boundary and tidal mixing we get these tidal mixing fronts which create potentially good feeding conditions um, and we can see that reflected in where common dolphins are because i do have sightings data for, for some of this area not as much as for down here for, the, for this time period okay if we move on to the next slide um september we've got some uh more orca cruises further out and, and what the orca cruises show us is that while our little worlds are confined to very close to the coastline whales and dolphins worlds aren't and um if we had data for the whole area we would see a lot more sightings further out offshore and probably a, neat, a more even picture of distribution but we can see a really widespread distribution of common dolphins across the whole whole map we've got the offshore bottomnose dolphins on here um inshore bottomnose dolphins must be further east and we haven't got data for them because i can't see them interestingly in september we've got some good sightings of brissos dolphins up around padstay and um still looks really productive around the estuary there and um, we've still got these strong harbour porpoise and common dolphin sightings in Falmouth Bay and Mounts Bay. Um, okay, if we move on to the next slide. And so in October, similar pattern, we haven't got any cruise data for offshore, but we can assume that it's probably a similar picture. Um, and then, okay, if we move on to the next slide. And November, Looks like there's a lot less cetaceans around, but what you tend to get in November is a lot stormier weather, less people out watching, less uh, less conducive conditions to spotting animals, less boat trips going out. We can see AK cruises are still going out in Falmouth, and where they're still going out, we're still getting good sightings. So we could assume that the same would be for the other areas um, that we have seen. Okay, can we move on to the next slide? And again, December, things quieten down with people observing again. What we are seeing though is where people are out observing, the harbour porpoises are starting to creep up this north coast again, and we're starting to see them up on the northern coast. The bottomnose dolphins are back off Cornwall and um, still getting common dolphin sightings. Well, that's um, 2021. Um, what I've shown you there is really, really limited by the fact that we, we need more data. And for the report, it would be great to have more data to include. So if you have sightings data, it would be really useful for it to, us to have um, that to include in the report to get a decent picture of what's going on out there. OK, can we have the next slide? So, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Please ask questions. Um, sorry for the uh, interruption with the noise and I'm going mute, um, but I hope uh, you all got something out of my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Um, I think because we're pushed for time, we'll just move straight on. Um, yeah. We'll uh, have Cheryl and Claire from um, Seacrest Southwest next. They unfortunately can't be with us today, but they have uh, pre-recorded their lecture for us. Um, they both studied marine biology and have decades of experience uh, volunteering with various marine organisations. And they've been the volunteer coordinators for Cornwall Wildlife Trust Seacrest Southwest project for the last few years. And they'll be telling us about some of the wonderful sightings around Cornwall last year and the Seacrest Southwest project in 2021. One second. Ellen, I'm not getting any volume. OK, one sec. Yep, 
Hello, good afternoon. My now? name is Cheryl Yarum, and later you'll be hearing from Claire Owen, and we are the Seaquest Southwest Project Coordinators. And thank you for inviting us today, and sorry we can't be there with you in person. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Seaquest, I'll just give you a little bit of background to what the project is about. Seaquest Southwest is a citizen science marine recording project. We train up amazing volunteers in a robust methodology to enable them to go out around the county and conduct effort-based surveys to collect data on all marine megafauna that they see. So this isn't just whales and dolphins, this is seals, basking sharks, sunfish, tuna, all the big things in our sea. We have two special days a month. We have Seacrest Sundays, which is the first Sunday of every month. We invite volunteers to go out around the county and survey between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. to try and get a snapshot of what is happening around our coast. We also run public watches on the third Sunday of every month and invite all our volunteers to come and watch with us. And we also use ad hoc sightings records sent in by members of the public as well as volunteers into the online recording Kerno and Silly app, the Orcs app, and this is hosted by the Environmental Records Centre. And all of this is done to achieve our aims of Seaquest, which are to engage people with the marine environment, to collect data on marine wildlife, and in turn, all of this information is then used to help understand, better protect and conserve our marine wildlife. So today I'm going to be talking to you about all of our ad hoc records in 2021. These are the records that have been sent into us via our Orcs database by volunteers and members of the public. We had a fantastic year for cetacean sightings in 2021. We had 11 different species. We collected 1,738 records over 140 different locations. Now, each record could be made up of one animal or a pod of over 100 animals, which makes these results even more remarkable. The most commonly seen animal is the common dolphin. We had 895 records of those. We had 539 of harbour porpoise. We had an amazing 112 records of minke whales, which is the most records we've ever had. And again, the same for the Rissos dolphins, 97 of those records, again, more than what we've ever had. We had 48 bottlenose dolphins. 18 humpback whale records, 10 fin whale records. We'll be hearing more about those in a little bit. Some of the rarities we've seen around in 2021 were the pilot whale with one record, three orca records, two striped dolphin records, and three white beak records. And Claire will be telling you a little bit more about those later. One of the questions we're most commonly asked here at Seaquest is when is the best time to see cetaceans around our coast? And as you can see from this graph, you can see them year round. Both common dolphin and harbour porpoise are seen throughout the year with records in every single month with peaks in the summer months. Minky whales were seen around our coast every single month except for November. We had bottlenose dolphins seen every month except for September and November. 17 of our 18 humpback whale records were seen in January and fin whales were seen sporadically throughout the year. If we look back over the last seven years, the four most commonly seen cetacean species around our coast, you can see that harbour porpoise and common dolphins have always been the most commonly sighted animals. Waternose dolphins have slightly decreased from around about 100 records in 2015 down to the 48 records in 2021. However, what's really interesting is that minke whales have increased from about 20 records up to 112 records, which is absolutely amazing. And as we've seen over the last year, we've been getting more and more larger animals in our waters. And that brings me on to the fin whales. We've had 19 records of fin whales submitted to us over the last two years, which is more than the last 20 years worth of records put together. Fin whales are the second largest animal in the world, which is absolutely amazing and incredible that we're seeing them off our coasts. They can reach speeds of over 40 kilometers an hour, giving them the name the greyhounds of the sea. In the summer months, they feed in the Arctic and travel down south in the winter to breed. So they could be stopping around our coast during their migration to feed, which just goes to show you how productive our waters really are. So here is a map of all the fin whale records showing you all the locations that they've been seen at. This is both in 2020 and 2021. And as you can see, also one record was captured during a 2020 survey, which is brilliant. Each of these individual sightings were of one animal at a time. So it could be thought that maybe this is just one animal that was hanging around our coast to feed and just being spotted from various locations by different people. But actually in 2021, 
this record was entered into orcs and this was of four different animals all at the same time and there was four animals seen which is absolutely amazing so we now know that it's not just one animal that's been seen around our coast there are many animals coming into our coast to feed which is absolutely fantastic and really exciting that's everything for me thank you very very much i'm going to hand you over to claire now thank you so much um Cheryl. Um, and as Cheryl said, I'm Claire. I'm also one of the Sequest Southwest coordinators. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the exciting sightings that we've had in 2021. Explain a bit more about our effort surveys um, and tell you some of the results from those. And tell you about a fantastic report that we're working on um, that has been funded by Natural England. Um, and also let you know how you can get involved with Sequest. So we've had lots of really great sightings in 2021. Um, some of the exciting cetaceans that we've seen, um, we've had pilot whales, and they're really like beautiful, mostly like nocturnal animals. So normally in the daytime we see them, they're moving really slow. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting when we get to see those. Um, we've had striped dolphins, who again are really, really beautiful dolphins. They're quite similar in size and shape to a common dolphin but they're normally found in more pelagic waters, slightly warmer waters, um, sort of around like the Bay of Biscay, you get lots of them. And most of the records we get in um, Cornwall are stranded records. So it's really exciting to have a few uh, records of them alive. We also had some white-beaked dolphins. Um, the closest resident population of white-beaked dolphins are in Lime Bay in Dorset. Um, and so we do in the summer occasionally get visitors um, over into South Cornwall. And we had 18 humpback whale sightings, which is really exciting. Most of those were in January. Um, so we had quite a lot of humpback whales um, sort of the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Yeah, so it's really, really great to see um, amazing animals like that. But the most exciting animal um, sighting that I think that we had was we had walker in Cornwall. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more um, about that. So it was quite interesting how the story um, sort of came about. So sort of late afternoon in May in 2021, um, we were made aware of a potential orca sighting, which everyone obviously gets really excited because it's really exciting to see orca. But we often get records of orca and they turn out to be um, rizzo's dolphins because sometimes they do look quite big and very black um, or sometimes they're just um, whale, you know, just like a minky whale or something. But by the next morning, it had been confirmed that two orca had been photographed. So um, most of the other sightings we get of orca in Cornwall um, are never really confirmed with a photograph. So it's really exciting when you get a photograph um, and when you get a fantastic photo as well. Um, so the photographs were actually good enough to identify the individual orcas. So they were identified as John Coe and Aquarius from the West Coast community. Um, and the West Coast community mostly live up in Scotland, um, on the west coast of Scotland, um, and that's, UK, that's the UK resident population um, of orcas. And so this is the first record of this population travelling this far south. So, so um, Cornwall Wildlife Trust first confirmed um, orca sighting for decades. So on the 14th of May, um, nine days later, both these individuals were spotted near the Isle of Skye, so that's 895 kilometres from Cornwall. So they travelled pretty much 100 kilometres a day, which is impressive. They're pretty amazing animals. So it's very, very exciting to have those in our waters and to have such amazing photos like these ones. Um, so now I'll tell you a little bit about our um, effort surveys. So we follow an established methodology um, and it, they can be conducted from any elevated site where you've got a good view of the coast. They're completed by volunteers who are trained on the Sequest Southwest Protocol. Um, so we do a four day training day, um, which consists of a morning where we do um, theory all about marine mammal ecology um, and all about our training techniques um, and how and exactly how we do that and a bit about health and safety as well. Um, and then we all meet up in the afternoon on the coast um, and practice our sea watching. We conduct surveys from all around um, Cornwall's coast. We've got volunteers spread around everywhere. And this data actually makes a huge difference um, and influences policy and legislation. So here's a few results from our effort survey. So these are just the surveys conducted by our volunteers uh, for 2021. Unfortunately, we haven't completely finished um, entering all our data for 2021. So this is our effort surveys um, information from January through to October. And um, we will have all our data analysed and put into a final report later on in the year. Um, but even just from January to October, we had 138 cetacean sightings. 
so that's 801 individual cetaceans. So this is just cetaceans. We do also collect data on um, seals and shark species, including basking sharks um, and tuna, which we see quite a lot. Um, so for just from the cetaceans, um, we also had 189 hours of effort from our volunteers, which is amazing. You can see from this plot here, we have our um, cetacean sightings um, for each month. Um, and the hours of effort um, as we were in lockdown in February. And that's why there was uh, very few hours of effort there. And interestingly, common dolphins were consistently sighted. And it's interesting that there were absolutely no harbour porpoise sighted in August, which is um, quite unusual. Quite a few minke whales in March, April and August. So interesting um, variety of sightings um, and effort actually throughout the year. Our volunteers conducted 97 surveys um, at locations all around Cornwall, so all the way from um, North Cornwall right round to the south of Cornwall. So now I'll tell you a little bit about our um, natural England report. So we're really excited um, to um, announced that we are writing a report which is funded by Natural England. So the report will be to review our data collection and its validation and storage methodologies to make better access for our volunteers. So we are working with the um, Environment Record Centre to try and um, sort out our database and make it much easier to um, put information in. Um, we're also going to make our data more accessible to external partners, um, which means that it can be used a lot more um, for analysis or for students um, and things like that. We are analysing Seacrest data collected over the last 10 years, so from 2010 to 2020, to look at any um, hotspots for different animals, um, so just for cetaceans, any hotspots for cetaceans, um, looking at how our effort has spread out um, all around Cornwall, and just see how the sightings have changed as well over the last 10 years. So this report will be published next month. So we're very, very excited um, to share that with you all. So this is just a little um, sort of one of the plots um, from the report. So uh, here we have our sightings. Um, so this is kind of an idea of what the sightings have been like over the last 10 years. This is the five most commonly sighted species. So we've got grey seal, common dolphin, harbour porpoise, bottlenose dolphin and minke whale. And as you can see, effort has changed quite a lot and our sightings have definitely increased, um, particularly from 2018. And we had huge sightings, um, huge, yeah, huge lots of sightings in 2019. So it's really exciting and we can't wait to share this report with you when it's published next month. How can you get involved with Seacrest? So if you are interested to find a bit more out of our project, um, you can follow us on social media. So we've got Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can also send us an email and we will get back to you with all of this information. So if you haven't got time to write stuff down now, um, send us an email and we'll send you links to all of our social media um, and our training and things like that. Um, you can join us at an event. So you can find our programme on, if you go to the Wildlife Trust, um, at the Sequest Southwest page. We have a programme, so we have public events each month. And we have quite a few events in at the end of July for the National Whale and Dolphin Watch. Um, so yeah, if you check out our programme, it tells you exactly where all our watches are. If you would like to volunteer for Seaquest Southwest, we always love having new volunteers. We do have um, our next training course, which is coming up on the 2nd of April. So that's a Saturday. Um, you can get tickets um, through Eventbrite or um, go onto our Facebook and um, we've got all the information on there. Um, it is a full day training course um, where it's online in the morning um, and then in the afternoon we all meet up at St Agnes and practice our sea watchers. So it's a really great day and it's a fantastic way to meet other people that want to volunteer for Seacrest um, and we always love having new people recruited. So yeah, if you are interested in that, um, please get a ticket or go onto our social media or um, you're welcome to just drop us an email if you need to. If you do see any marine sightings, we always love to hear more about it. Um, so you can share them on Orc. So that's the online um, recording system. So on the, through the ERCUS website, um, and it's a really, really easy way to just share your sightings and then those data um, go towards helping policy and legislation as well. So it's always great. So thank you so much for listening. I'm really sorry that Cheryl and I can't be there in person and this is pre-recorded. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sorry we're not around for the Q&A session, so um, email us or I'm sure Abby can answer any of your questions. Um, so thank you for listening. A huge thank you to all of our volunteers um, for your data contribution. Um, and thanks very much.
Bye. Well, thank you to um, Claire and Cheryl there. As they said, if you have any questions, please do um, drop them an email or Abby um, might be able to answer them in the Q&A session. Um, so next up, we have Dan Jarvis. Um, Dan has been a marine mammal medic at British Divers Marine Life Rescue for many years and acts as the Cornwall Area Coordinator, as well as recently being promoted to Development and Welfare Director. Um, so Dan's going to be talking to you about the humpback whale sightings, photo ID and management in 2021. So over to you, Dan. Thanks, Helen. I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully that's come up for you. Does that come up for you now, yeah, Helen? Yeah, I can see that now. Okay. OK, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm really aware that we're running behind on time, so I'll try to whiz as quickly as I can. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the Cetaceans webinar for Southwest Marine Ecosystems today. Um, I should probably point out uh, that al although I am from British Divers Marine Life Rescue, this is very much not a British Divers Marine Life Rescue talk. This isn't data uh, that uh, that we collect, but it's data, as Duncan said earlier in his talk, that has been amalgamated from many different sources. Um, obviously, there's a, quite a heavy bias towards uh, Cornish data sources because of the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the um, Sequest Southwest uh, sightings program that we've just heard about and the Environmental Records Centre that collects um, and retains all of that data. Uh, but we're really, really keen to collect more data from other sources as well from other areas of the southwest so we can build a better picture of what's happening in Somerset, Dorset and Devon uh, as well. So um, after our webinar we still have the annual report for Southwest Marine Ecosystems that we're going to be working on and that uh, will hopefully by then contain any more data that we're able to collect in the meantime. But my talk today is focusing really on the baleen whale sightings from the last year during 2021 and the first humpback whale photo identifications that we've had in southwest England, which is very exciting. Starting off with the minke whales, of course, we're going to go small and go big as usual. Um, from the combined sources of data currently available, we have 134 sightings of these, mostly single animals, as they do tend to be for the baleen whale species, but there have been occasional uh, sightings of pairs and even one pod of three minke whales together. Uh, in Devon, there was a single sighting recorded that we're aware of so far from Berry Head. The majority have come from Cornwall, ranging around the coast, going anti-clockwise from Tintagel down towards Padstow and Newquay, uh, past Perrinporth and St Edmunds to St Ives Bay, uh, around the Land's End Peninsula area and out to Wolf Rock, uh, and then coming back into around Mounts Bay, uh, around the Lizard to Falmouth Bay, and then heading up towards Mevagissey and even a sighting off Lou. Uh, we've also had some good data from the Isles of Scilly uh, this year, thanks to the Isles of Scilly bird group that's uh, been sent in recently. Uh, so the majority of sightings appear to have come from the south and east sides of the island of St Mary's. Uh, that's the main and most inhabited island uh, on the Isles of Scilly. Uh, but what's most interesting here is that's where the deeper water area is. So there's a deep water channel between St Mary's going south towards the next island, the furthest south island of St Agnes, and then to the east, uh, looking back towards Cornwall essentially, there's the Eastern Isles which uh, 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 traditionally uh, appear to be a good feeding area for minke whales uh, that we've heard about previously. Uh, we also had sightings on the uh, in other areas, one from the Northern Rocks, which is sort of towards the north and the west of the islands near Tresco and Briar, and also a few sightings from the Salonian Ferry Crossing as well. Uh, some of those will have come from Orca data as they utilise the Salonian Ferry for some of their survey work. Uh, many of the sightings actually occurred during summer, but the first ones actually came in January this year, which seems to be a little bit earlier compared with the previous years, looking back at the reports that we've done for Southwest Marine Ecosystem previously. Um, 
what uh, does seem to be consistent is that we're getting a small peak in the early part of summer, late spring, early summer, or in around May. Uh, then it seems to drop off a little bit and then picks up again between July and September. And again, this is fairly consistent with previous years, looking again at the um, previous years of Southwest Marine Ecosystem reports as well. Um, it might be really interesting to uh, start tying this up with some more of Duncan's data that we've seen on thermoclines that he presented earlier on in this session. Uh, say whales, uh, we hardly ever get any sightings of these, but what has been remarkably consistent over the last three years is that we've had a single sighting of a single animal three years running. Not sure if it's the same animal, of course, uh, but what's been most interesting is that in 2020, uh, uh, sorry, in 2019, and 2020, the sighting of the say whale was off Padstow uh, by Padstow Sea Safaris uh, both times. Uh, one of those sightings was in June and the other was in July. Uh, 2021's sighting was actually of a lone animal northeast of the Isles of Scilly in July. Uh, so again, we have some at least consistency that we're getting the sightings at the same time of the year. Uh, what, be really, what would be really fascinating is if this potentially could be the same animal. Really hard to say, of course, probably really desperately unlikely, uh, which I completely appreciate. But um, just given that sightings of this species in this region are so rare, it would be really difficult to um, uh, get that kind of data easily, of course, because the lack of sightings uh, just make that so logistically hard to do. Um, so that has been really interesting, at least in the consistency, but maybe interesting that there's been a sighting further away uh, from Padstow, which has most definitely had the monopoly on these species for the last previous two years. Uh, for fin whales, we have had 39 sightings from the uh, currently combined sources that we have available to us for data. Uh, again, mostly of single animals, but occasional pairs and two pods of four, one of which Claire highlighted in the talk just now was off the lizard recently. Um, there was uh, another pod of four off the Isles of Scilly uh, as well last year too. Um, around uh, Cornwall, the majority of the sightings came from uh, around the north coast, heading from Padstow Bay to Newquay and St Agnes again. There was a sighting off Portreath one day. Uh, then coming on to the south coast, the uh, area around Penberth Cove, Lizard Point, uh, which is where that pod of four was seen, St Anthony's Head just off uh, Falmouth Bay, and then moving up towards Mevagissey, uh, a sighting very, very long way offshore, seen by a boat south of Dogman Point as well. For the Isles of Scilly, uh, the sightings were largely in a remarkably similar area to the Vinky Whale sightings along the south and the east sides of the island of St Mary's, but also sightings from St Martin's, which is close to the Eastern Isles, which you mentioned earlier, but also St Agnes, where the deeper water is, then going up towards Briar. Uh, over on the western side of the islands. And then, of course, a few more sightings from the Salonian ferry crossing as well. Um, and the majority of these sightings happened in January, um, in December 2020 and January 2021. Uh, we did have a period of large numbers of sightings of humpback whales and fin whales, sometimes in uh, the same area feeding together. Uh, and that was a pretty exceptional event for us here in the southwest. We've never had those numbers of baleen whales in the area at the same time. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, with the fin whales, and we're going to see the humpback whales in a moment, it has been a particularly exciting time for us gathering data on this species, as we've never had these sorts of numbers in our waters in terms of animals and uh, sightings. Um, so, as I say, January was by far the most popular month for this species, with smaller numbers seen through spring and summer, and then another small peak in October, which may again be related to timing of their migration uh, and also really good feeding opportunities as well, particularly in that December, January period of 2020 and 2021. Finally, moving on to the humpback whales, uh, pretty much unprecedented, 63 sightings combined uh, from the sources currently available of data to us at the moment. And mostly these were single animals again, but there were occasional pairs and one group of seven at the Isles of Scilly on New Year's Day in 2020. Uh, that was um, 
uh, backed up with uh, a single animal off Land's End on the same day and two off Perham Porth. So on New Year's Day 2020, we potentially had 10 humpback whales in southwest waters, uh, which is extremely exciting. We've never had that before here as far as we've ever been aware. Uh, we had one animal in Plymouth Sound in Devon. Uh, I'll touch on this animal again shortly when I get onto our humpback whale identifications, but the large majority of the other sightings were for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, largely around the Land's End Peninsula from Mounts Bay right the way around to St Ives Bay, Perham Porth as I mentioned as well, but also a few sightings in Falmouth Bay and Whitsand Bay as well. Uh, we did also have one dead animal uh, which was in March that was seen off Lou, uh, Lou near Lou Island. Uh, it did actually become um, stuck on a reef uh, for a few days so it was actually there offshore uh, visible from land if you had some good binoculars to see that one with. Uh, it didn't actually wash ashore that one so we didn't get much other information so we're not sure if that animal could have been identified or what the potential cause of death could have been uh, but it's a really important record nonetheless of course. Uh, for the Isles of Scilly, uh, the humpback whales were pretty much everywhere around St Mary's, so not only were they along the deeper water sides on the east and the southern uh, coasts, but also in amongst the middle of the islands as well, called the roads. Um, also a few sightings on the Salonian ferry crossing as well later in the year too. Um, virtually all of the sightings, as I mentioned, they came in January around Cornwall, but they did stick around into February over at the Isles of Scilly uh, as well. So there was definitely a good time to be around this area for them at that time of the year. There was a small peak in the summer again, and we also had the really interesting sighting in December uh, just before Christmas of the uh, video, which I'm sure many of you might have seen on social media and in the news even, uh, of an individual on its back slapping its uh, both its pectoral fins uh, on the surface, which is really exciting behaviour. I don't think we've recorded that behaviour before. We've had lots of feeding activity, we've had breaching, we've had a few other things as well, tail slapping, but I don't think from memory that uh, we've had pectoral fin slapping or double pectoral fin slapping recorded here in the southwest before. So that was a really, really important sighting uh, and really interesting to see what they're actually doing as well. Now, moving on to uh, humpback whale IDs, uh, 2021 was a really, really exciting year for this. We've never had humpback whales that have been photo identified previously. Uh, so these are the very first ones that we're presenting to you now. And the first one is known as, uh, it's got two names actually, it's either called Cream Tea or Pi, as it was identified twice by different networks. And uh, thanks to Happy Whale, who are uh, an international recording scheme for humpback whales and other species. Uh, Lindsay McNeil, who coordinates the uh, UK humpback uh, identifications, photo identifications, Rupert Kirkwood, Martin Goody and IWDG, who contributed data to this individual sightings. Uh, now, as you can see, the uh, red dot is the first identification of this individual. This was on the 2nd of August 2019, south of Lamorna. Uh, this animal was uh, well photographed by a number of observers, uh, Rupert Kirkwood, Marine Discovery Penzance, uh, Atlantic Adventure and a few others, uh, feeding very actively off the coast during that summer. Uh, in August and October 2020, the same animal was photo identified by our WDG on the south coast of Ireland. And then on Christmas Day in 2020, that animal had actually come down to the Isles of Scilly and uh, anecdotally, I believe, was recorded for 60 days consecutively or at least 60 days consecutively from Christmas Day. So that animal obviously stuck around for quite a long time around that area. And as I mentioned previously, again, there was some really good feeding opportunities at that time. Uh, I should probably mention as well that I'm doing these photo identifications in order of when the animals were identified. So you're going to find that we're going to bounce around between dates uh, quite a bit in this presentation here. Uh, this has been a really interesting one, though, because in the uh, immediate aftermath of our first identification, um, a photographer over on the Isles of Scilly, uh, Robin Moore, posted a photo of a humpback whale that he saw back in 2008 at the Isles of Scilly, the 30th of August 2008. Um, and uh, that uh, photograph uh, 
I forwarded to Lindsay McNeil and through Happy Whale, she was actually able to get a match to an animal that was uh, reported, uh, sorry, recorded by the founder of Happy Whale, uh, Ted Cheeseman, when he was on a survey at the uh, Franz Joseph Islands, uh, which is right up in the Arctic Circle in August 2012. So that's a really incredible sighting from more than 10 years ago. We've managed to make this match four years apart in completely different parts of the world, but also interestingly in the same month during August. So uh, that's a really interesting record and it'd be really interesting to see if there's any more uh, animals that, uh, uh, sorry, if this animal crops up anywhere else at some point in the future again. Uh, moving back to more recent times though, we had a brand new photo identification thanks to Brenda and Adrian Tregunner. Uh, this is uh, the individual that was around in uh, sort of December, January uh, of 2020 and 2021. Uh, it had quite a distinctive uh, few white blobs on its right flank and there was a couple more on its left flank and they also managed to get uh, a, a tail picture which is the main one that is used for photo identification of humpback whales and this animal I do really need to go back and try and get the exact dates but we had quite a lot of sightings of this animal going all the way around from uh, Mausel past Porthcurno uh, around by Cape Cornwall uh, and even one sighting of it round at uh, St Ives as well uh, so this animal was seen several times over a relatively short period of time in this area around the Lands End Peninsula and up to St Ives Bay uh, so again, another really, really exciting one. Uh, then we have this whale, which you might have heard about in the news, actually. Um, it's actually unidentified at the moment, as we don't have many good photos of it. But I'm hoping here today in this webinar, if anybody did get photos of this animal, if they would be able to send them to us, because it would be really great to try and get a proper identification of this animal uh, and to see if it is known from previous sightings or if it has been recorded since this incident in July 2021. Uh, so on the 15th of July, uh, this humpback whale was seen off Mountbatten right in Plymouth Sound, which is quite close in for a humpback to be. Um, you know, they do tend to come relatively close to the shore, but this is maybe a little bit concerning with where it was. And at the time, for those of you who knew about this or heard about this, it was during the sail, the, the International Sailing Grand Prix. So there was a massive event with literally many hundreds of vessels on the water and a race course and, uh, um, and uh, wardens uh, sort of on boats going around and everything. And although there was a protocol in place for any sort of uh, marine mammal or other marine life, like basking sharks that might be in the area that might pass through the course uh, race area. Uh, we weren't really expecting there to be a quite sickly humpback whale passing through. Um, but uh, ourselves at BDMLR and the Ocean Conservation Trust who are based in Plymouth were involved with uh, sort of response to this incident and monitoring of marine mammals in the area at the time. And the, uh, the race organisers were fantastic. They stopped the race immediately when the whale was spotted passing through the race course area. Um, the animal, once it moved out of the danger area, they were able to restart and the animal was monitored by land and boat based observers, even aerial observers. They had a helicopter up doing filming and they got some footage of the animal as well. But what some of those photos showed was the animal was an extremely poor nutritional condition and they, they, that actually gave us real cause for concern here at BDMLR that this animal was potentially going to live strand or even die at sea uh, because it was in such a bad way and of course you, you know the carcass washing in on the currents might cause more problems for the sail GP uh, event as well. But over the next few days, we had this really interesting pattern of sighting. So from that first day on the 15th, we then had the uh, 16th, where it was seen in the middle of Plymouth Sound. Uh, and then in the evening, it actually moved outside of the Sound, past Wembury to the east and into the mouth of the Yelm estuary, where we did have a little bit of an issue with a couple of boats following it quite closely. Um, the next day on the 17th, uh, it was actually on the opposite side of Plymouth Sound near uh, Core Sand and King Sand. Uh, and then through the day, we had BDMR medics observing it from land and reports coming in from shore based observers as well, uh, ringing it into our hotline as it passed around Rainhead up through Whitsand Bay. It made it as far as Millendruff over near Lou. And then in the evening, it actually went back over to Tregantle in the middle of uh, Whitsand Bay. Uh, and we were able to get a, a boat up relatively close to get some video of the animal, which 
confirmed further our concerns for the animal's health. On the 18th of July, uh, the animal was seen close to Blue Island first thing in the morning. And then uh, as we got towards lunchtime, it had passed Talland and Polpero and simply wasn't seen again. We had no more sightings of the animal reported. We called Coast Watches. We mentioned it to Falmouth Coast Guard as well in case it made it as far as uh, their station at Falmouth on the headland at Pendennis. But no more sightings of this animal. So uh, again, really important if anyone did get any photos of this animal that can help us with photo identification, that would be really amazing. Uh, then we have another new ID here, thanks to Happy Whale. I actually found this one completely by accident while I was researching this talk. Uh, I went onto the Happy Whale website to look at the photo IDs for the uh, Southwest England area. And this one popped up, which was from a uh, survey that was being carried out as it passed by the Isles of Scilly on the 16th of July. This animal, they managed to get a photo ID shot, uh, never previously been uh, recorded before by happy whales. So this is a new animal, uh, a new one for us here in the Southwest and makes up uh, the next in our exciting line of humpback whale photo IDs for this region now. And then finally, uh, we have one more, uh, which um, was recorded in August 2016 originally at the Aran, Aran Islands up on the west coast of Ireland, County Galway. Uh, between 2016 and 2021, there were 16 more sightings of this animal on the west and southwest coasts of Ireland. And then in June 2021, this was its last sighting uh, of the Basket Islands in the sort of southwestish sort of area of island before it was then recorded down here in our part of the world on the 29th of August two months later it was recorded at the Isles of Scilly by Joe Pender uh, who got the uh, photo of it to match back to Lindsay McNeil and IWDG. Uh, so those so far are all of the whales in just one year that have been in photo ID'd through the images that people from Sequest Southwest uh, and other observers out on boats have been able to take. And it's been a really amazing start to, uh, and, and quite an unexpected start, I think, for all of us, getting so many humpback whales ID'd in one year when in 2020 we had none. And then in 2021, we've had five, potentially six, if we can get our unidentified sick whale ID'd as well. Um, so it's been a really exciting time for humpback whales in the last couple of years. There have been a lot more sightings than there have in previous years. Uh, I would say 2022 so far hasn't lived up to it, maybe some expectations, but what? who are we to expect these animals to turn up when we want them to? Hey, so <laughs> keep those sightings coming in. It's all really, really incredible and important data. And again, if you've got any questions, uh, do feel free to contact me. I think hopefully um, time hasn't been uh, too unkind to me on this one, but I'll leave it there in case there is a little bit uh, of time for anyone to ask anything or if you want to put anything in the chat box and I'll try and get back to you there. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I think just because we are running a little bit tight on time, um, we'll save the Q&A for the end. But if anybody has any questions, please do pop them in the chat or use the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to have a quick break now. Uh, we'll keep it to five minutes. So back here just after um, quarter past and then uh, we'll continue with the rest of the presentations. So quick five minute break and then we'll all be back for continuation. Thank you.
Shall we start? Yeah, I think we'll get going again. Um, so I hope everyone's refreshed and toilet broken and all that jazz. Um, <laughs> so we're going to have a talk from Nick Draganza next. Um, Nick has spent many years developing acoustic instruments that detect the echolocation of cetaceans. Um, these instruments are now used um, on all continents and have been a main research tool for cetacean monitoring, in particular um, bycatch mitigation. Um, so it will be a recorded talk. Um, Nick will be around for the Q and A, um, but this will Nick will be talking about the Cornwall Acoustic Project. Hello. Okay, crabs to crustaceans. Uh, seashores are a kind of wonderland of otherworldly questions. And some of them you can answer just by looking around, like why does Helen, the rock pool? Next thing, it's the wrong talk. No. It is the wrong talk. One sec. Mm, ba, 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 ba. This is the Southwest Marine Ecosystems meeting. All good. But I wanted to start my talk <laughs> somewhere else. And um, this is actually pictures from a pod deployment near Odessa on the Black Sea. So Chelonia, uh, which makes the, the F pods, um, has donated a bunch of them to the countries around the Black Sea. Um, where they were very enthusiastic about trying to monitor trends in the cetacean population. So you can see the, the pod there before it goes in the water. And you can see it here when it comes out. And, um, you know, I've decided that when I grow up, I'm going to be a flaxy barnacle farmer. <laughs> anyway, um, here is the team. And uh, from the bottom up, we have got Bulgaria, then uh, Georgia, Turkey, Romania, Turkey, and the three on the top are all Ukrainians. So uh, Julia, who you've seen already, she's a PhD student. She's now sheltering in a basement in Kyiv. She's donated blood to support the army, Pavel, Next is her supervisor. He's out west. He's volunteered. Um, but things are quiet where he is. And the third person, Karina, is was actually out of Ukraine in Italy when the um, the war with Russia started. So they're very much um, on our thoughts. And they, they have been very pleasant, very inspiring and engaging people to work with. And they've set up an organization called Black Sea Trends with its own logo to monitor Black Sea cetacean trends from these pods that are situated everywhere except in the, the Russian sector where previously I was uh, getting pods deployed in the Kerch Strait there by Pavel's dad. So it's incredibly worrying, but even before this, it did make me think, well, crikey, we make these things here and uh, the Black Sea is ahead of Cornwall. And why do we need to monitor trends? Well, the fact is that animals change their numbers very drastically. Um, and it goes unnoticed for a long time. So this is a result of a retrospective survey that the Cornwall dolphin group did um, 
and we piece together from people's memories what had been happening and you see this big decline in the middle of the last century which we now know is largely due to DDT and organochlorine pesticides we thought it was going to be mainly gill nets but it wasn't However, uh, the, the take home message is these things get recognized very late. And the same is also true of the significance of gillnet bycatch. So subsequent to that retrospective survey, we put observers on fishing boats and we got fishermen to discard tagged animals at sea. So those little diamonds are where porpoises were discarded with tags on their pectoral fins or tail stops and none of them stranded you can see the the sort of um, mean surface currents marked there and some work that you you may have seen comes from the uh, French team in La Rochelle who've always done the best work on on uh, the origin of stranded cetaceans done anywhere in Europe or anywhere in the world, I think. And what they've done is they've used um, a model of sea surface water movements, which has real data fed into it. So what they do basically, they get an animal that gets um, stranded down here and they reckon from its state of decomposition that it died somewhere between say five and 10 days ago. And they track it's a likely surface movement back using this software called Mothy that has real data on winds and so on. And they say it must have died between those two points. And then they assemble a lot of these tracks from the hundreds of dolphins that strand along this Biscay coast and conclude as produce a sort of heat map of where they died, which we're looking at there. They also have produced similar kind of heat maps of what fishing effort of different types was going on. And they've come up with extraordinary um, valuable conclusions. Um, so in, Cor in uh, Cornwall and in the southwest, really, we um, have been sort of <laughs> stimulated into action by our own success in getting things started in the Black Sea where they've raced ahead of us. So now uh, I'm trying with the help of the Wildlife Trust and uh, Joe Dennett, um, who's working with me to um, set up uh, an array of FPOD loggers around the, the coast of the southwest of, of England. And we've called it CAT with a double T, Cetacean Acoustic Trend Tracking. So we haven't specified which cetacean. Basically, we can distinguish porpoises and dolphins, but we can't yet draw a distinction between the dolphins. I think we will become able to do that. And we're focused on monitoring trends. That's over a number of years. And so um, we've done work on the the sort of statistical methods you might use for that. And now we're trying to build up this network. And one exciting thing is that, um, just a sec, how's the time going here? All right, um, that we will find other stuff other than trends and hopefully we'll find it quicker because there'll be rather a long wait before we get any useful sort of trend estimates. Um, and so some of you will have seen this before, but this is data from an FPOD deployed off uh, Le Morna, um, you know, west of Mausel, about um, a mile out. And what you're looking at here is three and a half minutes of days, and each of these coloured spikes is a whole bunch of clicks made by a dolphin. Now, these dolphin clicks are very directional. So the animal has to be made basically looking at the pod to get all these um, these sort of bursts of clicks to register on the pod because it could be multiple dolphins and we could discuss that. I'm sure actually it is just one. Um, and if we dig into these, which actually isn't difficult because the whole way the F pod works is built around being able to 
unpack the click rates within these click bursts, we see a really quite extraordinary thing. In the first group, there was one of two patterns of click rate, either that one or this, this sort of more peaky one here, starting at, you know, somewhere around 60, 70 clicks a second, going up to maybe 200. Then there was a little gap. Then there was a whole bunch of click trains. And the, in these, they were clicking at very high rates up here, somewhere in the sort of 700 to 900 clicks a second, and invariably diminishing through the click train. So there were 13 of those. And then there was, uh, if you remember that first graph, there was quite a little gap. And then the animal returned and made or resumed making noises directed at the pod and um, produced a whole series that, again, completely different from the preceding um, two click rate profiles. So we already knew that these click bursts were social and some authors had um, proposed that the the significant thing about them was the modulation, you know, the pattern of change of the click rates within each burst. And this absolutely bears it out. So this is quite extraordinary, actually, because we don't really know of any other animal that's got this, um, you know, this, this sort of very directional beam uh, in which it's um, projecting its sound. So it can sort of speak to one person in a group. Um, maybe not quite as precise as that, but you get the idea. Um, and while we're kind of failing to get our act together here, we've also supported the development of a project in Brazil on the Amazon where they've tried out sticking a an F pod in the water to see if we could distinguish this animal, the Boto, the Amazon River dolphin, from the Dutukashi, the, the uh, a, a river dolphin, Sotalia fluviatilis, that rather resembles like a, a very small bottlenose dolphin, much more conventional looking animal than this wonderful creature. So the Boto was thought to lack all the sophisticated social communication produced by oceanic dolphins because it didn't have whistles. And you probably know that oceanic dolphins are famous for having individual names embodied in whistles. These are called signature whistles. And the Boto seemed to lack all that. But what the F-Pod showed straight away was absolutely staggering. They were producing, they are producing, and quite frequently these very fast click trains that are much too fast to be useful as echolocation or trying to find animals or see obstacles. And they're very highly structured. You know, you can see the sort of wiggliness of this, isn't it? A sort of random thing. And there are lots of different patterns here. And some of them are going up to 1600 clicks a second, which is really the fastest that's been recorded for any such social communication by any any animal. So suddenly we discover that the Boto has a world of social communication. It's not the, the sad river dolphin that is sometimes referred to as evolutionary relic that lacks um, the sophisticated whistles of oceanic dolphins. It's moved its whole social repertoire into a different realm, that of the click rate of its click trains. So those are click rates up there. This is the amplitude of the, um, the clicks. And what you can see here is these very fast click rates all kind of form a block. And then you've got some fast stuff going but you've also got slower click rate trains from a different animal occurring at the same time so hopefully we will see more interesting stuff on that from our study of um dolphins around cornwall 
and in the Black Sea, actually, they have um, shown us, a, you know, quite incidentally, amazing social communication by um, by porpoises, which otherwise uh, uh, have been thought to sort of really lack social communication because they didn't have any whistles. Um, so that's just about it. That's the project where we're sort of pulling together groups um, who can look after a pod location long term and we're hoping it will enable us to sort of discern trends in the population of these animals. So if they're hit by a new pollutant or an epizootic, you know, which can be very devastating. <clears throat> a measles type of virus killed 80% of the striped dolphins in the Mediterranean Sea. So, you know, the fact that the organochlorine pollution problem has eased up here, at least, doesn't mean uh, we don't have to worry anymore. We still got bycatch, um, which is big and could get worse. And we've got epizootics and other pollutants. So um, I hope that gives us sort of quick picture of where this cat project fits in and how it, it relates very strongly to things you've already heard um, about bycatch and distribution of animals. OK, thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, we'll move straight on, but again, if you have any questions at all, um, please do leave them in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, next up, we have Natalie, who is a veterinary consultant for British Divers Marine Life Rescue. Uh, she manages and provides the veterinary care for the Cornwall Seal Hospital um, and also provides veterinary care for any stranded cetaceans in Cornwall. Um, so Natalie will be talking to you about the cetacean live strandings in 2021 and solitary social dolphin management. So over to you, Natalie. Lovely. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to turn my camera off while I'm speaking, um, just because I tend to be able to share the videos a little bit better then. Okie dokie. Um, so good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm just going to be presenting this um, fairly short talk on the live cetacean strandings which have occurred during 2021 in the southwest region um, that BGMLR are uh, aware of. So the first strandings were actually very um, early on in the year. So this 2.3 metre male common dolphin stranded in St Ives on the 3rd of January in a uh, very poor condition. Um, it died very shortly after stranding and on post-mortem uh, examination, the animal was confirmed to be in a uh, debilitated state um, and was an older animal with no evidence of recent feeding um, and a significant pneumonia. Um, that no doubt contributed to uh, to the stranding in the first place. And then funnily enough, on the same day, in fact, this 1.8 metre female common dolphin stranded at Western Supermare. Um, she was noted to be in overall good condition, um, but again, sadly died um, soon after stranding. On the 10th of January, this uh, common dolphin was actually filmed stranding by a member of the public at Gwythians. Um, so I'll just let this video um, play briefly so you can see what happened. I'll try and point out the dolphin when it appears. Just here. You can see it thrashing in the surf here. So the dolphin was then actually refloated by members of the public um, and was noted by them to have some bones exposed on one wall flipper. Um, so BGM Lar didn't actually attend this animal. Um, uh, this was well, a freshly dead animal rather was found the next day in the same area, um, but we weren't able to confirm uh, if it was the same one as it had washed out again before um, it was able to be recorded by the Marine Strandings Network, but it seems um, pretty likely. 
And then in mid-February, a uh, humpback whale actually came uh, into the area for a few days near Gloucester in the River Severn. Um, it was filmed on one occasion here uh, in shallow water, and you can just see it sort of picking itself across the mud, um, but it didn't actually fully strand. Uh, and after this, then uh, this occasion, it wasn't seen again. And then moving on to um, March, um, so the 21st of March, a 2.2 metre male common dolphin stranded at Bigbury um, and was put to sleep due to um, its poor condition, um, which you can actually see quite nicely here um, in this photo as the depression beneath the dorsal fin, um, which should obviously normally be nicely uh, rounded when they're in good condition. On the 22nd of May, a 1.6 metre juvenile uh, male striped dolphin stranded downriver from uh, Padstow um, was refloated multiple times early in the morning by a member of the public before it was reported to us. Um, sadly, it was found dead on arrival um, and with some quite severe damage to its beak and its jaw, uh, most likely to have occurred uh, at or just before stranding. Um, on post-mortem examination, it was found to be in moderate condition, um, but no evidence of recent feeding, and it had a meningitis as a result of an infection with a bacteria called Brucella seti, um, which is seen quite frequently in striped dolphins. We had a very long way to transport the dolphin back to a car to go off for post-mortem, so we actually ended up um, thanks to Dan Jarvis uh, commandeering the local passenger foot ferry, um, who very kindly gave us and the dolphin a lift uh, back up to Padstow, which um, was greatly appreciated. And moving on now to discuss um, a solitary social bottlenose dolphin. Uh, this is Nick. So he's recognisable from a small healed injury, creating a uh, V shape in the top of his dorsal fin here. Um, and this caused some confusion initially uh, with um, a similar um, previous social solitary from several years ago who was called Klett, um, who had this same sort of similar marking. So Nick was originally identified in the Isles of Scilly during a brief visit in June 2020. Um, he then went on to uh, County Cork in Ireland, where some low levels of um, human uh, interaction began. He returned to Scilly in August uh, 2021, where these behaviours sort of slowly uh, developed, mainly following boats uh, and on a few occasions approaching uh, swimmers close to the shore where he could become quite excitable. And then later in August, this was interspersed with short visits to Cornwall, including uh, the Helford Estuary, Penzance uh, and Newlyn Harbour. At the beginning of September, uh, he was reported a number of times following boats from St Ives Harbour before uh, moving on to Carbis Bay and then into uh, Hale Harbour, where um, a very serious incident unfolded that was um, very widely reported in the media. So here he approached um, a large group of people, mostly children, uh, who were already in the water uh, and became increasingly excitable and erratic, uh, posing a real danger to the swimmers as he was thrashing his tail literally inches from people's faces. Um, BDMLR and the Surf Lifesaving Club personnel requested uh, that everybody left the water um, and the Surf Lifesaving Club boat um, actually led Nick out to sea. But this sudden ramping up of his uh, level of, of habituation and behaviour um, was extremely fast compared with other social solitary dolphins um, and messaging such as that shown here um, was, was issued urgently to advise people on how to act um, appropriately around him. He then wasn't seen until a few weeks later back in County Cork following boats uh, and then a few days later sadly washed up dead. Um, with evidence of boat strike, which you can see here, um, which is sadly the outcome for uh, many social solitary dolphins. Uh, the last one, of course, being uh, Danny in Dorset in 2020. 
Um, so we skip ahead now to early October when a pair of common dolphins uh, stranded on mudflats at Myla Bridge on the outgoing tide that they managed to uh, self-rescue by luck uh, before BGMR arrived by sliding down the embankment back into the water. Um, they were then monitored circling up and down the creek uh, until the tide came in enough to um, get past Myla Harbour again um, without intervention, thankfully. Uh, and then finally, uh, on the 28th of December, a pod of eight common dolphins, including a calf, uh, were monitored circling off um, place in the Pakul River through the afternoon. Um, as it got dark and near to low tide, uh, they uh, rather abruptly ent uh, entered a small um, sort of shallow inlet uh, where they were semi-stranded in the mud. Uh, but still able to kick themselves through and they also managed to self-rescue as the tide turned a short time later um, and then continued to be monitored uh, well into the evening. They were reported to actually have been in the river for uh, at least three days prior to this incident um, and thankfully were, were not seen again afterwards. OK, so that's a, a very, very brief um, sort of summary of the strandings that we had in 2021. Uh, just to say, as always, many thanks to the various organisations uh, with whom we work. Uh, and finally, please remember to uh, follow our social media pages to keep up with what we do. Um, visit our website, check out the information about our um, BGMLR Marine Mammal Medic courses um, and consider maybe booking onto one of those if you're interested. Uh, absolutely anyone can train with us. Um, you just need to be uh, at least 18 years old. So thank you very much for listening. Happy to take questions whenever um, Helen feels it's appropriate or in the uh, in the chat. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, we will yeah do Q and A at the end, I think, um, and we'll move on to Abby now. Um, so Abby is Marine Conservation Officer at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, she leads various projects within the Living Seas team. Um, including the Marine Strandings work and your Shore Beach Rangers project. Um, and she'll be talking to you about the Marine Strandings Network today. So over to you, Abby. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And I, I'll try keeping my camera on, everyone, but our internet's being a bit dodgy at the Wildlife Trust. So if at any point I freeze, just shout at me, won't you, Helen? Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm Abby. Helen's done a lovely introduction. And um, I'm going to keep today's talk brief, not just because of time, but because we have an entire conference dedicated to the Marine Strandings Network next Saturday, the 12th of March. I'll mention it again at the end. So plenty of opportunities if you want to find out even more. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be um, discussing the Marine Strandings Network and the results from 2021. And of course, as always, let me flag that I'm obviously representing a team of people that work on this project from our Marine Conservation Manager, Ruth Williams. Williams, a brilliant Anthea, our data officer who processes the data and does bycatch evaluation, our team of hotline coordinators who man our 24 hour a day, all year round hotline. And of course, our on the ground volunteers who go out like, like Annabelle Lowe here in this picture um, to review and assess the carcasses on the beach. And of course, James Barnett, our veterinary pathologist. Now, I'm really aware that a lot of you have um, are well aware of the Marine Strandings Network, but for many of you who aren't aware, let me just quickly introduce the project. It has been running for nearly 30 years, everyone. Um, 1993. So we'll be celebrating 30 years next year. I thought it was this year, but I got it wrong. It is next year. And we gather data on all organic material. OK, so although there's a big focus on cetaceans, it includes fish, turtles, sharks, jellyfish, mollusks, seabirds. Um, but we have a lot of sort of funding and conservation focus on cetaceans and also seals. The project is managed by Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the data collection and data processing is, is within the Environmental Record Centre for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. We heard them mentioned earlier in the Sequest talk, but our entire function is by volunteers. We cannot do what we do without volunteers. We have that 24 hour hotline that's at the top of this slide that's manned by volunteers. We have around 150 trained volunteers who go to the to the site and even the postmortems are, are mainly conducted by James as a volunteer and with teams of volunteers themselves. It is gold star citizen science. It really is and something we're very proud of. So when a carcass is reported to us via that hotline, we can 
send out those trained volunteers to the beach and we can assess those carcasses in situ on the beach. However, if they are suitable, and that basically means very fresh, they can go to post-mortem um, to discover the cause of death. So from what I always say this in all the press that we do, from a very sad event comes an invaluable opportunity to observe these creatures up close, to get more information on their biology and ecology in a non-invasive, relatively cheap method. Uh, and we can use that information. It's such valuable stuff to assist in their, their conservation, in their management. OK, now alongside the recording, the actual practical recording side of things, as you can see in the bullet points down the side, we have a load of other outputs. We have um, our annual report. We have our annual forum, another, another nudge, and I'll say it at the end. We have an annual training day, which often happens in the autumn. We have social media and we have newsletters. Our data is used in research and the creation of papers. And of course, we also sit uh, influence policy and sit on many working groups and management groups, for instance, um, bycatch initiatives. OK, so really, really important stuff. And just how we sit. OK, we're Cornwall Wildlife Trust. This is the Marine Strandings Network, very focused on Cornwall. We we manage all strandings for Cornwall, this county alone. However, we sit uh, under a national initiative. So this slide gives you that. So the Natural History Museum is mentioned there. Now, the Natural Muse History Museum have collated records on strandings since 1913. They've been doing it for a very long time. But in 1990, they started collaborating with the Institute of Zoology. And that eventually evolved into what is now known as the UK Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme. That's that logo right at the top of the slide. So that is under the management of the Institute of Zoology. And we are an official partner in this national programme. We sit alongside um, the other national organisations and we contribute sometimes up to 30% of data, national data, just from our county. More often it is 20%, but that's significant. So you can really see how valuable our county level work is. And at the bottom there, must mention our fabulous partners, British Divers and Marine Life Rescue, Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust and University of Exeter, who we work really closely with in this county to do the work that we do. Now, this graph here very clearly shows the total number of cetacean carcasses that have washed in around our county since 2000. I want to just call out quickly here that we haven't fully polished and reviewed our, two, our 2021 data yet. It takes an awful long time to get it in um, and to process it and to tidy it and to cross-reference it to all the national data and the post-mortem uh, reports, etc. So big caveat there that what I you may see represented today may not be in our 2021 report. Uh, for you know, fully fully represented in our 2021 report it may change slightly but what we can see here is that we had 205 strandings in 2021 uh, it continues the past sort of six year pattern of really high rates of, of carcasses. And what I really want to flag here is that what you're seeing is a really true representation of carcasses that are stranding. Our project is very well recognised. It's very visible uh, around the coastal community. You know, our coast guards, our lifeguards, our councils, our cafes and businesses, they know about us and we get those records in. So it is really a true representation of the number of carcasses that are coming in. Uh, particularly since 2000, when Jan and Jeff Loveridge, a big shout out to them, created such a high functioning project. Just quickly looking at the species we had in in 2021, uh, by far common dolphins, highest number. Really interesting that over the last 20 years, we have shifted towards more common dolphins and, than any other species, particularly harbour porpoise. Uh, the dolphin species there at 33 coming in second, um, that's only identified to that level because of probably because of decomposition rates or because the carcass wasn't fully assessed by our volunteers before it got washed out to sea. Of note, there is also two resist dolphins, a pilot whale, one min minky whale uh, and a humpback whale. And that humpback whale was off Lew Island. Um, it, it was, uh, we feel it was potentially entangled off the back of the island. And we have some photos of it, but it, they're not high enough quality um, to be entirely clear and eventually it washed away. So we don't have any more information on that humpback whale. 
Now, looking at the months where strandings occur, you can see we have strandings throughout the year, um, but January to April are, as frequently seen, are the busiest months. And um, we have an outstanding month there. We have March, where we had 42 carcasses in in one month alone. That's an awful lot um, over that month. You may question why do we get those higher frequencies of strandings at certain times of the year or at certain even certain days, weeks of the year. And of course, there can be many factors which impact strandings, you know, from weather systems to anthropogenic events and so what I wanted to show you here to sort of link to that this is the table and again a, a quick pull of post-mortem records from 2021 and a, and a huge caveat you know I'm representing James Barnett's um, list there and CSIP's list and it is absolutely not finished yet so the number uh, and information may change in the 2021 report however what we do have in the database at present is 27 carcasses were suitable and went for post-mortem in 2021 a majority of those are common dolphins but we also had two um, striped dolphins and a selection of harbour porpoise and out of those 27 carcasses we can see that um nine of the seven of the carcasses or sorry nine of those carcasses had cause of death of bycatch that's 33 percent and in fact in march so if we remember from the previous slide that in march we had this huge number of strandings at 43 was it um for that month of those seven carcasses which were retrieved for post-mortem in March, seven animals went in for post-mortem, five of them were by court. So that is 71% of those carcasses were by court. So it's highly likely that that March peak was associated with a fishing event or fishing activity. And again, you know, this is just flagging again that bycatch, and it was mentioned earlier by a few people, is is continues to be a really significant problem. Um, thirty three percent is is not appropriate. In twenty twenty, we had thirty percent of all our carcasses um, cause of death was by bycatch. It's inappropriately high, and the UK government are working towards a number of strategies which flag the requirement to reduce the bycatch significantly in our waters. Um, but decades on, we're still seeing this unacceptably high value. And it flags, again, the value of our work in collecting the evidence required to put pressure on our government agencies and those which manage our fisheries to put better action into play to prevent bycatch happening. Um, and also linked to bycatch, it's not just post-mortem. So as you just saw, we had 27 carcasses in 2021 went to post-mortem. That was 27 out of the 205 carcasses which stranded. So what about the other 178 carcasses? You know, we're losing data from those. Well, around 50% of those other carcasses won't be suitable for assessment, probably due to rate of decomposition. And also the fact, again, they've just been washed out to see we haven't got one of our trained volunteers to them however there are a selection that remain on the beach that aren't taken to post-mortem and that we can still get really inf um, interesting information from and that's where beep comes in um, beep oh, that's the first bullet point the bycatch evidence evaluation protocol it's an invaluable tool to assess bycatch on cetaceans in situ on the beach on the beach by these trained volunteers. We've got detailed photographs of the carcasses are taken, so you can see some of the photo requirements on the right of this slide, and they're assessed by trained assessors to find those signature injuries and features identified as being associated with bycatch. Uh, it's been, this protocol has been developed from 25 years of experience and expertise. It's continually tested um, and being developed. And although I cannot give you a, a BEEP result for 2021, which you do find in our annual result, uh, results, um, reports so you'll have to wait for our 2021 report for that what is great is that we have a superb bit of research going on with the University of Exeter and with the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and led by Nikki Clear who used to be our marine officer at the trust and who now works at JNCC and Nikki will be talking about her BEEP research at our upcoming MSN forum next 
week. Um, so you can hear more about BEEP and uh, and the research that's going on and uh, and where it's going next week. And actually, that's where I come to an end. Um, to flag, we have this annual forum, annual conference. It actually hasn't happened now since 2019. January 2019 was the last time we met. Um, so three years ago, we, we uh, apart from some online um, activity, it is hybrid. It's in person. We're holding at the um, Truro College in Truro, in Truro obviously, um, but also available to watch it online. And it's open to everybody, not just our volunteers. And the booking is via Eventbrite. Uh, we will be making a decision at the end of this week about whether we move the whole event online if we don't have enough in-person uptake. Um, so if you are interested in coming on the day and buying a ticket, please do um, do so ASCP so we can make that call towards the end of this week. But it's always a really fabulous, inspiring, uh, warm event. Um, so I do recommend it. OK, so I'll finish there. I would like to recommend that if you wish to learn more about Strandings, download our annual reports, follow us on social media, we're on Instagram and Facebook, attend our forum next week, and now you're allowed to get your phones out, even though you've all been doing it surreptitiously for the last two hours. Get your phone out and put that number in your phone so that um, you can call us if you ever find a stranded uh, animal around our coastline. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, much, Abby, and thank you again to all of our speakers today. Um, we will move to Q&A now, um, and we've got a few in the chat, but if you have any more, please do just pop them in and uh, we'll read them out. Um, so first one goes to Duncan, Dan and Abby. Uh, what do you think are the main impediments to data sharing? A, by people with tranches of data and B, from casual observers. With regard to, would there be mileage in having dedicated meeting like we did for the bottlenose dolphin data sharing? Um, who, I, I'm happy to go on this, but uh, yeah, um, Abby's got her hand up as well. You go ahead. Oh, so, um, so um, I think there's a, a lot of issues. One of them is um, we get a lot of marine charities collecting data, and so we'd over the years send off our data to lots of different charities. And there's duplication then, because if they then submit that to a wider um, body, there our data is getting duplicated like five times, but that can be accounted for. A lot of those charities you send data to and you never see it again, and you never see anything from it. And when you send them an email for something like this, suggesting it might be useful to see some of their data, you don't get a reply. Um, so that can be tricky. So they some some and not all some charities seem to hoard data like it's their property when they're collecting it from other people and then they won't share it, um, which I think is troublesome. That might be a bit controversial to say, but it, it happens. Um, another problem is formatting. Um, so just for that talk that I did, I had data in about 10 different formats that I then had to collate into a single format to be able to display. And quite often, when you transpose um, coordinates, you lose precision all the time because of the way geographical systems work. So having standardized formats for data would be good, but that can be quite tricky. Knowing the quality, so knowing the experience of the person submitting the data, because we can get misidentifications and things like that. And receiving it in big chunks rather than small chunks is also easier. I might let someone else come in now. That's kind of my things that I've noticed are a problem. <clears throat> Well, I was going to say, I agree with Duncan, there's a plethora of recording schemes across the southwest, and so it can become confusing for the public, that's sort of related to the public um, comment, to w know where to send their record to. That shouldn't be a problem if, if all of those organisations were communicating better, which then sort of leads on to the next point of having a sort of better collaborative approach to sharing this data, um, which just involves better communication and clarity, so that just like we did with the Southwest Bottlenose Dolphin Consortium, when you actually get people together in the room and, and, and discuss things clearly, that you do get buy-in and you do then get um, fantastic partnership working. So I think that's a really good idea moving forward um, everywhere, let alone for the Southwest. Um, and yeah, that, that sounds great. 
Great, thanks. Anything to add, Dan, or are you happy? Uh, no, I think everything was covered really well there. I think um, I, th I think if we boil it down to the key points, it's making sure the public have an awareness that they can report their sightings and who to, and then for those who collect the sightings to be able to collate it in an easily usable way for research purposes, but also to have that sharing, like sharing agreements and things in place as well with other organisations. So we can all make use of our various data sets, but <sighs> for the greater good sort of uh, situation, because we, with more data, we can do better conservation actions with putting it towards consultations, um, looking at habitat diversity, uh, ha uh, sorry, habitat use uh, and trends over time, that sort of thing. It's all really important stuff. Um, and as more and more people are interested in the marine environment, we should be able to collect a lot more of this data more easily. So I think we need to work on ways that we can facilitate that but I think also at the same time it's those organizations having the staffing to be able to do that in the first place too yeah Duncan you've got your hand I was up. just going to say there is something really exciting happening at the moment um, uh, the joint station um, data program that um, is trying to collate lots of different data sources into a standardized format to cover the whole of the UK I know the wildlife trust are involved with that we're involved with that and see watching that watch from all over the country and that might be the future of of looking at citation data more widely um but it's something that's just kind of starting at the moment great thank you um a co another question for all the speakers from nick um why are we seeing more large baleen whales we can Anyone take, want to take that recovery from a recovery due to better management from past declines would be nice, wouldn't it? But of course, as we always say, we've had a good year. Does this mean a long term trend in increase? We don't know. So it shows the value of our reporting systems and uh, initiatives like this in the Southwest Marine Ecosystems um, to continue monitoring uh, and seeing sort of longer term trends and whether this may be indicative of a population increase, perhaps. Thanks, Abby. Um, um, I, another question. Are you going, Duncan? I was going to just say it is interesting because we I think our whale sightings have, have doubled year on year from about the last four years. But it, we've also had this mass influx of common dolphins and bluefin tuna sightings like occurrences are going up year on year. So that it could be a, to do with prey availability here or, or shift of prey. But like Abby said, it's saying we need longer term monitoring to understand are they shifting from another area? Are they are the populations increasing? We we don't really know. Great, thank you. Um, question from Fiona. Um, Abby, how do you think the lockdown will have affected the data? It's likely effort was less normal in 2021. Less than normal in 2021, sorry. Well, actually, really interesting. So I live by the coast and something we were really, well, a lot of people really, you know, right let me just go a lot of people embraced was the environment as we all know during lockdown and in and in addition to that you know one of your daily exercises would get out and look at the sea was really good for you and even my other half um when walking and sea watching um during lockdown so i think actually we we were fortunate to have you know people around our coast who did go and watch even during lockdown because of our you know locations so we felt it might um and people were more aware and sort of kind of getting a bit more involved we thought it would impact data um and and i'm not sure it, it necessarily did for live sightings strandings obviously we really could not send people out to strandings full stop um you know there were a selection of people who lived by the beach who could walk as their daily exercise and do the odd and see the odd thing but that really did collapse in 2020 in that march um april early may 2020 that our strandings did disappear but um otherwise i i, I think actually we were surprised at the volume of data we did get for 2020 and now 2021 i'm really looking forward to putting 
2021 21 data together actually just to clarify that because this is all just how we feel you know from our responses and from what we kind of get in but it'll be lovely to actually look at the numbers great thanks abby yep go ahead dan yeah, I, I was just going to follow on from what um, Abby said there with British Divers Marine Life Rescue call outs to animals in distress around the coast, um, both locally and nationally. We we actually had an increase uh, in the number of animals being reported. Um, I do need to look closer at the data to see whether that's actually an increase in the number of animals that did actually need help or if it was just an increase in the number of animals people were reporting because they were concerned, but ultimately weren't in distress of any kind um, but just generally our call out numbers in BDMLR have skyrocketed over the last four five years um, and Covid doesn't seem to have dampened that trend at all nationally. Great thank you. Um, another question for Abby uh, from Lauren. What initiatives are there for fishermen to ensure their nets are discarded appropriately to reduce entanglement? Also in the post-mortems, do you find plastics to be a common cause of death? No, well, second, no, no, no. Co top causes of death are bycatch, natural diseases, bottlenose dolphin kills, that sort of stuff. That's top three, not top five, sorry. Um, pl plastics, no, not at all, have been discovered in certain species, more so than others, more so than wet, uh, but... No. First question, entanglement. That's um, There are initiatives. There's the Fishing for Litter initiative that's been running for a very long time. Um, that's the main one I know of. And I know also of there's lots of fantastic circular economy businesses now that are trying to use fishing gear in uh, recycling schemes, you know, to make things like kayaks and uh, sunglasses. So I know that they're pushing sort of trying to access that sort of waste um, for their businesses. But apart from that, actually, I'm not like, you know, the best person to ask on that. I'm sure there's better people to ask in this in this uh, in this forum. Dan, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to come in there to add alongside those projects. Um, BDMLR has been involved in a uh, two year project looking at entanglement of mainly large whales, but also other species like basking sharks in creel fisheries in Scotland. Um, uh, the person leading the project, Teddy, uh, went out and actually did face to face interviews with a lot of fishermen around Scotland and was able to collect a huge amount of unreported data on dead and live entanglements of large whales in creel fisheries gear. The really great thing about this project was that it was a partnership between conservation organisations, including Whale and Dolphin Conservation and the Creel Fisheries uh, Federation as well, Scottish Creel Fisheries Federation. And back in December, we released the uh, report, which I'm just going to drop the link to the website where you can download everything. But it was very much working with the fishing community, the Creel Fisheries community, uh, to get a real idea of the scale of the issue, but also looking at some of the solutions. And as part of that, we were um, uh, involved in helping train some fishermen in the basics of large whale disentanglement so that they can, you know, attempt it more safely as sometimes they're trying to do it completely on their own unsupported, which could be really risky. Uh, but also looking at other um, uh, ideas for the future, such as ropeless technology, which I believe is now being trialled in uh, North America in some places for the North Atlantic right whale on their migration routes as they're highly uh, prone to becoming entangled in creel gear and as a uh, population that's at real risk of extinction. It's actually one of their uh, highest, like, like Abby said, with bycatch here in the southwest, it's one of their highest causes of death on their migration route. Uh, so using ropeless gear means that it just completely eliminates that threat um, and hopefully we'll be seeing initiatives like that starting up in the UK soon. And this, this uh, Scottish Entanglement Alliance project, as I say, I've just dropped the link in the uh, chat box there for anyone that wants to look at the report or the lovely glossy short version, which is much easier to read and <laughs> understand. Uh, it's all there freely available. So please do go ahead, read, share, digest, uh, use, yeah. implement. 
It, I, th I think actually also just to mention there is that the, the question was related to sort of um, dis discarding used, broken, you know, broken off fishing nets, which we would consider almost ghost gear. When we talk about bycatch, it's entanglement. Yes, accidental entanglement in fishing gear, but it's often live. So we're talking about gear that is set and that is fishing, um, not, you know, pieces of net that are floating around in the ocean and that may cause just cause bycatch. I think maybe there's some confusion there. And in which case there is, you know, a series of uh, mitigation tools that the fishing industry can use to reduce bycatch. And there's an awful lot of work going well, there is work going on into that um, in the southwest. Um, there's some pilot projects going on um, in regards to looking at those tools and how we can reduce bycatch in our fisheries. Just going to say as well on on just on this is on the discarded net um, idea as well. A, a ten, it's about ten years old now, but there was a across Europe report that found that on average each single netting boat loses five kilometers of gear a year that's that's the average it's quite a sobering thought if you think about how many netters there are across Europe how much ghost gear there is out there <clears throat> I don't know if that's changed in the last 10 years um, but that's the food, food for thought yeah thank you um Dave has asked um how are strandings numbers relative to increased cetacean sightings I guess for you again Abby or anyone. It looks like Abby's frozen. I think she's frozen, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have any data on that, but it's likely that the more cetaceans we've got in our waters, the more strandings we're going to get. And um, it would be, and, and that is considered when people are giving strandings reports and looking at the impacts, anthropogenics or human impacts on cetaceans they're not just saying oh my god there's increase in strandings they're, they're looking at as a proportion of the um of the animals that are in our waters as well that's something they take into account when they're modeling that kind of stuff um but definitely if you've got more animals you're going to see more stranded um because they strand when they die from old age as well as from all these other horrible side effects of the fact that humans are living on the planet um yeah, yeah dan Yeah, thinking to um, like live strandings data uh, that we or, or or even just call outs to cetaceans that might be at risk of stranding when we had the um, huge amount of common dolphins around in sort of um, December 2019, January 2020, um, kind of thing just into February as well, we, we had an enormous number or say enormous um, maybe a dozen or so which is a lot by our standards of calls to either live stranded cetaceans or um, cetaceans that were at risk of stranding during those months when we had a huge amount of common dolphin activity around the coast at that time so that i i feel anecdotally and per, from my own personal experience there was some correlation there but then we've also had common dolphins around at other times where we perhaps haven't actually seen similar, a relative sort of similar increase in the number of call outs that we're getting to cetaceans in distress. So it's, it's maybe a little bit of a muddled picture, um, but you, I suppose it's given to the reason that if you've got more animals around that you're more likely to encounter either stranded animals live or animals that have passed away for one reason or another. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm just aware as well that I think a few people weren't able to access the chat for um, questions. So apologies about that. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, please just ping them to me and I can pass them on to any of the speakers. Um, but I think if we've got no more questions, um, then just another thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, and I will pass on to Brendan um, to give some final closing remarks. So thank you, everybody. Hi, hello, everybody. And Nick Trugens is actually here in my office hiding uh, if you've got any questions for him. Um, and Abby's trying to get back into the meeting. There we go. Hi, uh, so um, 
I thanks again to all the all the speakers and all the questioners and congratulations to Helen for organising a very complicated meeting online. Uh, actually, maybe a bit easier just to organise it in a room in the future. Um, maybe we should go for something novel like that, like meeting in a room with other people from now on. Uh, some sort of synthetic thoughts uh, from having sat through here um, through all the talks is that um, I guess what a great place to live and work and be in the southwest with a diversity of cetacean species is the one thing that makes me think. What a wonderful network of people doing great things. Great. Some ocean optimism. There are some species that were gone that maybe are on the way back and that together we might actually uh, be more confident about whether that fact is actually true. There's more data out there than was shown here today and so I'm left thinking about how we as a group join together more effectively, whether it be through national um, JNCC led initiatives or if it's more bottom up and talking at a regional basis, uh, get the data together and be more um, more exhaustive and more useful and more powerful. Uh, how do we correct for effort uh, and integrate disparate sources is something that I think we need to work on. Um, could we make more of the Salonian was a thing I was thinking about. Uh, there was a point in time where there was almost every vessel, every trip was observed a, a, a back in the good old days. Maybe we need to get back to the good old days and go places, be on boats and be in rooms together. And how do we su better support next cat project a, and use that to help compare and calibrate the land based and boat based surveys that are going on and uh, look back and add value to those. And uh, generally, you know, it's definitely going to be a group effort because it needs eyes on the water, it needs boats, it needs people, it needs time to observe, to collate data, to analyse data, it needs collaboration. Uh, and we're lucky we've got a whole bunch of uh, good uh, organisations all working together in the Southwest, uh, partly facilitated by the Southwest Marine Ecosystem Initiative. So three cheers for us all and um, Thanks again, Helen, and to all the speakers. And uh, I'm taking away as an action that will, like we did before, and organise the bottlenose dolphin thing. I'm thinking at least for Cornwall, but maybe also for the whole Southwest, we might have a little meeting and actually think hard about how we can up the data integration and gathering to really uh, best exploit everyone's efforts. Hey, I just. Um, a quick note that um, Helen is also organising and we are hosting the climate change meeting for Southwest Marine Ecosystems on the 9th of March and the SEALs meeting on the 16th of March. Same format as this. A link is in the chat if you want to um, if you want to actually be added to the mailing list. Uh, and uh, other than that, I think Everybody deserves to actually have their lunch, except for those people I saw who were sneakily having their lunch um, during the meeting. Uh, and uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.